Hello there and welcome to Smith and Sheridan on Biotech, a podcast on the science and business of biotechnology presented by me, Cormac Sheridan. And me, Andy Smith. Hello, everyone. Hello, Cormac. How are you this week? I'm good, Andy. How are you doing? Not too bad, thanks. This week, we're not exactly reporting the news. The announcement happened a little while ago. Morphosis entering an acquisition agreement with Novartis for 2.7 billion euros. The acquisition itself is what it is. It's a sort of a, what you might call a medium-sized deal. Large pharma buying a biotech company because of a promising lead compound. But behind it, there is just the weight of history that has to be explored. Morphosis isn't just another company. It really is part of the very fabric of European biotechnology. It predates most companies in the sector. It was founded in 1992 in Germany, and it was known for nearly all of its history as an antibody platform company. Mm -hmm. And In particular, it was one of those companies that did its business in terms of antibody discovery with a phage display technology. It had this branded platform called HUCAL, Human Combinatorial Antibody Library, and various flavors and iterations of it followed over the years, and the occasional little patent dispute with Cambridge Antibody Technology, which I guess was one of the inventors of that technology, or at least its scientific founders were. So Morphosis isn't just any other company. In European terms, it loomed very large, and for a long time, it was going very successfully. And then it wasn't. The platform, as I mentioned, has produced a blockbuster drug, but unfortunately for Morphosis, it's a drug that is owned by J&J, Tremphia, I'm referring to, also known as Guzelcumab, which was first approved in 2017 in psoriatic arthritis. It's a, an interleukin-23 blocker. It's an anti-inflammatory drug. And just in the last year, 2023, j j reported annual sales of 3.1 billion. But obviously, Morphosis is only seeing a little piece of that, and it entered some sort of complex deal with Royalty Pharma just a, a little while back to basically they were getting cash up front for future royalty flows. And so... A lot of that cash has already been sort of added to its balance sheet, as it were. Mm. So, I mean, Novartis is a long-standing partner of Morphosis. And there is a key link in terms of personnel, too, because Simon Moroni, the co-founder and longtime CEO of Morphosis, he stepped down from that role in 2019, having been at the helm for several decades, from 92 to, to 2019. And a year later, he joins the Novartis board. A while after that, he's the vice chair Obviously, this deal was all done above board and all the rest of it, I'm, I'm sure, whatever conflicts might exist were well managed. to be managed and dealt with. But I'm saying there's always a kind of a connection between the two companies. Mm. And it's just very interesting that the Novartis management sees value in what Morphosis is now. And I nickname them these days Metamorphosis because their acquisition of Constellation Pharmaceuticals led to this extraordinary pivot away from the antibody platform and embracing small molecules with kind of sophisticated, complex mechanisms for oncology. That's a very, very, very long intro. Apologies. Your thoughts on all that's happened with this deal, Andy? (laughs) Mm, Well, so many moving parts, you know, all all morphosis. You've mentioned the history. And when I was an investor, I'd, I'd invested in morphosis as an antibody company in the days when... Many of us specialist investors were investing in the likes of GemMab and Cambridge Antibody Technology uh, and the US versions, uh, Chiron even. So it's almost, as you were hinting, the antibody platform is almost, I was trying to think of the right word, divorced from the latest or the prior to the acquisition by Novartis, the latest investment proposition of Morphosis. It wasn't that anymore. And in fact, you know, the number of facets that you need for a good biotechnology company, you know, Amgen has taught us for years that you need good lawyers. But in the deals of other antibody companies like Cambridge Antibody Technology with Abbott in those days, with, with a product that went on to Humira, mm-hmm. 
and their battle over royalties because Humara was so successful and Vivas didn't want Cambridge to get as much as they were initially signed up for. And then we've seen the success in Europe with Gemmab, which is still you know, the only one then still going to be independent of these antibody companies. No, we, we... I would add Argenix to that as well. Okay, yeah, Argenix. But... And interesting enough, Argenix is now valued at more than Gemmab because I think it's just retained full marketing rights to its key products and... Aerogenics has been a massive success. Its, its current valuation is, is over 20 billion. That of Genmab is about 18 billion, and these are dollars rather than euros, I hate to add. As I was going to get onto it, depends. The other thing you need, apart from good lawyers and mm. some luck, is good business development people who can negotiate the right deals. Now, clearly, Morphosis perhaps didn't do it with Trenfire, or even if they did, they then gave it, well, sold it away to Realty Pharma. Gemmab with Darzalex has been much more successful. I mean, Darzalex. But then again, you know, people would say, you know, you would say almost with Argenix, well, no, why don't you retain it all for yourself? Well, if your lead antibody product is for a major indication, like in Cambridge Antibody Technologies case, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, a biotech company, even one that can raise money on the basis of the antibody platform, is never going to be able to launch a product into that very large and competitive market. The same is true nowadays with multiple myeloma and Darzalex, the antibody from J&J that came originally from Genmab. And again, that's the price you pay, or that's the price Morphosis paid for licensing Trenfire to J&J, is that you know, they're never going to market themselves as psoriasis. So it had to be done to a big partner. But that probably was not the mistake. That, that's not an error. That was a correct decision. I yeah. wouldn't call that an error. I mean, the sell-off of the royalties to Royalty Pharma it was a, a period of time which we've discussed as the wilderness period yep. where companies find it difficult to raise money. So it's a sort of have to, and again, the luck thing comes into it. So there are lots of moving parts to what makes a successful antibody company or at least biotech company. And though obviously Morphosis had some of those, mm -hmm. and then they also had their fair share of missteps as well. And just on that issue about Genmab and Darzalex, don't forget that Morphosis played around with the CD38 Target 2. Yeah. And they entered a kind of a cheap enough deal, really, with Celgene with a CD38 directed antibody called variously MOMOR202 or Felzartanab. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that was hard. The deal was quite small. It was like, well, it was okay. It was um, in euros, 70.8 million up front. 46.2 million euros in equity investment and 511 million in milestones. This was 2013. You know, that, that was a good deal. There was a lot of committed cash there. But two years later, Celgene exits that alliance. So yeah. that was not a competitive antibody. It just goes to show the virtual or the fragile nature of bio bucks, right? Because you mentioned those billions of dollars, but I mean, it never happened, right? Well, they still got a nice tidy 111, whatever it was, 116 up front, you know, that's nothing to sneeze at. But if we could eventually, I mean, we will in this discussion move on from the antibody mm. platform. But mm. I think mm. it's important to say that, yeah. and I was wondering what the right phrase, you know, for new monoclonal antibody platforms, the companies that have been acquired, like now Morphosis, like Cambridge Antibody Technology before, uh, like DIAX, if you were a biotech and a VC these days thinking of starting a new monoclonal antibody company, then... It's a bit late. Your time has passed. So even antibody fragments, if it's not a radio-labeled antibody, if it's not a drug antibody conjugate or new technologies that offer something that isn't already available, then you're into a commoditized market and it, why would you bother? And hence, yeah. Morphosis is move away from its antibody platform. Is that, is that fair? Absolutely. But the one thing I would like to say, and I do think it's important in retrospect, I do think that the synthetic in vitro approach is inferior to the in vivo approach. I genuinely believe that you get better quality antibodies more quickly from transgenic mice or from working with camelids, which Argenix is doing, even though they're not doing the fragment antibodies, they're doing full-size antibodies, but they are doing the llama business that Ablinx used to do as well. And I just think in vivo platforms are superior and they're, they're more productive. And it has been commoditized because the company that has impressed me most in terms of being an antibody discovery firm these days is Absalera. And I think they're on the West Coast. I think they're in, I can't remember if they're in Vancouver or Seattle, but they're up around there anyway. And 
they do this kind of very interesting microfluidic single cell approach. You know, they're very, very sophisticated, very smart people. And their market cap has come tumbling down. Their share price is a fraction of where it was. They're worth somewhere north of a billion now, but there were multiples of that a few years back, you know. It's a commoditized market, and Absolera's business model is kind of the old morphosis model for a new age, that you have mm -hmm. a vast partnered pipeline and you get percentage of the eventual revenues that your partners generate. They never plan to get into proprietary development because there was always that sort of... Uh, ambiguity about proprietary development versus partnering out as many antibodies as possible. And I just don't think Morphosis made that transition as successfully as GenMab has. And mm. our Genix cleverly always had a proprietary development strategy. They never, ever sought to, they did some license deals on, on key assets, but they never saw themselves as a supplier of antibodies to Big Pharma. And they chose niche immunological indications and they owned the full programs and they've executed to a degree that is just really, really admirable. You know, they've really done it. And on the other hand, I used to be in the other camp, though, Cormac. I used yeah. to be, no, it's got to be a fully human antibody produced in an Eppendorf tube from a library. And nothing mm -hmm. else works, right? Because yeah. fully human, right? I mean, yeah. fully human. We want things yeah. that are fully human. We don't want things that have gone through a mouse or a mm -hmm. camel mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. something. But then these days, I've moved on to be a bit more agnostic of the sort yeah. of the technology, yeah. just because, I mean, you remember GenMab's anti-CD antibody that was supposed to be an improvement on Rituxan, which is yeah. oh, a historical chimeric antibody. Nobody would dream to do that anymore. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Rituxan has far fewer reactions, injection site and other hypersensitive reactions than GenMab's and supposedly fully human. So I think I'm now more agnostic to the yeah. source of the antibody. As long as it works, and Humira has done for, yes. as a fully human, as long as it works and it doesn't give any reactions, I don't care where it comes from. You can yeah. produce it in snails if you want. That's fair enough. But anyway, what's Novart is buying is not buying an antibody platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's but it could have done, essentially... right? I mean, it, it could have done years ago. And many investors, including me, were hoping mm. 20 years ago that Morphosis, that, that deal they did way back in, was it 2007, Seven. when Morphosis became Novartis's antibody company, if you like. And everyone, yeah. including yeah. me, would think, well, that eventually that's a prelude to Novartis acquiring Morphosis. And for mm. one reason or another, that didn't happen. So you're about to say now Morphosis then ploughed its own path, including an IPO in the US. Yes, that's right. And also, it must be mentioned that there was another failure with the mm. Roach partners. Which took a long time antibody. to fail, didn't it? It took a long time to fail, you're right. It entered the clinic in 2006. And I think the end came in 2022 or thereabouts when it, it didn't deliver in phase three. Again, tenor you mab. I'm very bad at pronouncing Which is why antibodies. I prefer the trade names. Yeah. Everyone knows what your mind is. <laughs> and well, map. Sadly, this antibody didn't get far enough to actually warrant a trade name. So Novartis is essentially buying Constellation Pharma. And I do think that the Morphosis management do deserve some credit for that transaction, which, say, was initially treated with a lot of scepticism by everybody. <laughs> media yeah they investors. Share price suffered because of it didn't yes and the ipo and, and they had a lot of cash because of the royalty deal and all the rest of it they paid 1.7 billion they at one point were valued at less than their cash holdings yeah. and this was only last year and i remember speaking with the ceo jean-paul cress back in may of last year and he was very upbeat about the progress of the lead product this is the BET inhibitor, which is called Pelabrezib. He was very upbeat about it, that the data were going to come in the, later in the year. And it was the phase two data suggests if they repeat this, it's going to be a blockbuster, etc., etc., etc. And it might be a slam dunk, but it, it's a, a reasonably good outcome. And obviously Novartis wouldn't be buying this drug and putting down 2.7 billion euros in cash if they weren't enthusiastic about its prospects. And... It'll be a first-in-class drug, and these BET inhibitors, it's a very complex kind of a mechanism. You're trying to basically have a sort of a influence on gene expression in patients who have myelofibrosis, which is this scarring of the bone marrow, is how it's described. And it's a condition where basically... What's well, actually kind of extraordinary about it, it's a sort of a cancer, but it's a sort of an indolence. But it can be a prelude to other cancers as well. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. AML, I think, acute myeloid is a complication. But also, what's kind of strange about it is that because your bone marrow is essentially heavily compromised, the spleen becomes the primary site yeah, of red blood cell formation. Compensate. And that's why you get swollen spleens. Yeah. And for some reason, its function is beyond its capacity and it becomes swollen with lots of red cells. Yeah. And that leads to symptoms that aren't obviously hematological, although patients with myelofibrosis do have you know, clotting issues and anemia. But it leads to the clinical trials measuring things like spleen volume and swelling and the end point that this product didn't work in in the phase three total symptom score, which the FDA has yeah. asked yeah. other companies to show a statistically significant difference from. Yeah. So that then, I mean, that ASH announcement of the phase three results led to a bit of a, again, stock price hammering for morphosis. Okay, you've got the primary endpoint, but the other secondary endpoint, or TSS, that the FDA wants, you haven't got that either. But it's an orphan disease, or it's a rare disease, it's a nasty disease. It's, as we talked about before, things are not well met by the clinical standard of care. And there are even other products from AbbVie in development that are worse than this product. So the FDA is in an interesting position. I mean, you'd think that Novartis that have the JAK inhibitor from Insight, Jucafu, mm -hmm. which is approved in, they have the rights in Europe for myelofibrosis. So you would think that if anyone knows about myelofibrosis, it's Novartis. Yeah. And, and what's also interesting, of course, is that the phase three data they reported is when they administered Pelabrezib, their own drug, with Jacify or Ruxalitinib, the JAK inhibitor. And what also puzzles me is that they did get a very good outcome on the primary endpoint, which is a reduction in the spleen volume of at least 35%. The combination of Pelabrezib and Jacify, 65.9% of patients on that combination attained that spleen volume reduction, whereas those on placebo and Jacify only, only 35.2% of those achieved that. So there was a, almost a doubling. And that was a statistically significant result. And what's interesting to me is that that particular outcome is not reflected then in the total symptom score. I mean, there was a numerical improvement, but it's really pretty minor. I mean, basically, the two arms that were pretty similar in terms of absolute change in total symptom score and in terms of a 50% reduction in total symptom score. So that's kind of interesting to me that it's working on the spleen, but that doesn't carry over but, into but some it is sort of symptom reduction. logical from where we're heading. And we talked before about outcomes and stuff. Do you want to base the approval of a drug on a hematological measurement or a spleen volume, which is related to a hematological endpoint? Or do you mm -hmm. want the patients mm -hmm. to get better and have a better quality of life and yeah. possibly yeah. even then many of these patients are over 60, but have a, an economical benefit again. So the FDA wouldn't have or wouldn't demand those endpoints for a reason if they didn't have an eye towards functional endpoint endpoints that payers will be happier to reimburse than oh look the spleen volume's gone down well what does that mean well it doesn't feel as bad but then the total symptom score reflects on how well a patient is how economically active they can be even if they're pensioners they can go out and spend money more if their total symptom score is lower theoretically uh, that's the idea i suppose yeah but i would presume there'll be an fda advisory committee hearing on this i think drug. it's almost a certainty isn't it and again the deal with novartis acquiring morphosis there was lots of commentary on social media saying well if this doesn't get approved does the deal fall apart and i don't think the timing works out that yet because the advisory panel has not been stated yet so no they haven't actually filed right, yeah. for approval as yet either as well. it will be next year right yeah. and the deal can close this year so yeah and i'm not aware that there are any clawbacks that novartis gets some sort of well a... i mean it depends how good again the lawyers are i mean if there was a material adverse event clause then you could say well we bought this in good faith knowing it's going to get approved and you knew it didn't or did you know it's denied you don't want to get there and in all likelihood it won't the deal will close before the FDA decides on the product. Yeah, so I'm sort of inclined, I, I mean, I thought Morphosis had jettisoned its history and jettisoned the antibody platform. And it was a very bold move by Jean-Paul Cress. And at the time, I, like everybody else, I was a bit of a doubter. But I must say that it's 
a successful outcome in yep. terms of his tenure, but you could look at the tenure of the company as a whole. They had plenty of ups and plenty of downs, but Morphosis didn't actually make it. The first iteration of Morphosis didn't deliver ultimately. I mean, it had a lot of promise, but it just didn't quite get there at the end. It certainly had a successful antibody platform. It certainly delivered drugs. It did a ton of deals. Some of the deals it did were absolutely enormous. I mean, they did this huge deal with Insight, $750 million up front for a drug that annual sales last year reached $92 million. Yeah, and Insight, as part of this three-way deal with the Morphosis acquisition by Novartis, Insight are buying the parts of that drug that they don't own for, what, $25 million? Chump change or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was an extraordinary deal. So they did really well in certain respects in terms of the development. Insight should get Morphosis's lawyers, I think. Yeah. And actually, though, that particular drug, Monjuvi or Tefastamab, an anti CD19 antibody, and that's a difficult target for some reason or other direct antibodies against, whereas the CAR T's, it's the, obviously the, yeah. the target of choice. And so this antibody was supposed to be taking on the CAR T's. And if you've got a CAR T levels of efficacy with an antibody, you're doing great. But it's a decent drug, but there's a lot yeah. of competition from the CAR T's, there's a lot of competition from. B cell directed agents that use yeah. other targets such as CD20. So it's never really delivered, but it actually wasn't from the Morphosis platform either. It was from Zencore, the Californian company. So that was an interesting one. That was a, yeah, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma was the, the first approval. So essentially, Morphosis is no longer Morphosis, it's essentially Constellation Pharma, and that's essentially what Novartis is buying. And it's paying 2.7 billion euro versus the $1.7 billion, which Morphosis paid for it back in 2021. But I suppose the difference in price reflects the value that has been added in the sense that the programs have achieved, a, or as the lead program at least, has achieved the phase three outcome, which, as we've discussed, is positive. It mightn't be yeah, a stand Yeah, and of artists are best placed having marketed Jucafi yeah. in, in Europe to opine yeah. on that or put its euros behind its or its dollars and I think it reports in dollars where its thoughts yeah. are. So that's fine. And the result has come to Morphosis eventually in that it's been acquired. But I mean, I don't know whether there are any original Morphosis shareholders alive still that were invested uh, that are still invested in Morphosis, but there's pretty few and far between. And people like me who invested in the antibody platform and then left the company because it didn't form as other antibody platforms mm. or be acquired by Morphosis in the time period will be feeling a little scarred that they didn't stay the whole course and mm. that they didn't want the transition from a antibody company to a small molecule company. And after the ASH announcement last year, when Morphosis' share price tank on the secondary endpoint, they would be probably breathing a sigh of relief. But today they'd be kicking themselves because they didn't stay for the acquisition. It's been a an up and down or a volatile period at tenure. And it's exciting, right? I mean, this is biotech. Mm. Yes, it is. And I'm just taking up my tiny violin there to play a tune for the investors because the patients come first. <laughs> anyway, I think that wraps up Morphosis, or as I have been calling them, Metamorphosis. <laughs> but I'm not going to make any direct references to Franz Kafka. It doesn't apply in this instance. <laughs> to the next time, Andy. Yep. Cheers, Cormac. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. 